So, thank you, Lucy. Um, I am very, very pleased to welcome you to our first of six webinars in the Agricultural Medicine and Occupational Safety Training this fall. We are um, pleased to have Dr. Julia Smith as our first presenter. She is uh, a, an Extension Associate Professor at the University of Vermont. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree, her DBM and PhD degrees at Cornell. Her ongoing research interests include the interactions about, among nutrition, growth, and immune system development in young dairy calves. She also has, uh, as you can read in the course um, website, she conducts trainings for extension educators, livestock producers, and community members on the risks posed by the introduction of a highly contagious animal disease and the importance of preparedness in all sectors of the livestock industry. Um, she also serves on Vermont's point of contact for the National Extension Disaster Education Network and co-chairs that organization's Agro-Security Committee. Um, we are very pleased, as I said, to have her be our first uh, faculty presenter and um, look forward to hearing from her. Uh, I would ask if you have any questions about accessing the course website, um, if you can uh, contact me after the webinar is over, I'll be glad to help you with that. Julie, welcome. Thank you, Jean. Hi, everyone. I wanted to let you see me live for a few seconds before I turn it back to um, a still image. Um, I have kind of a boring background here, so I think it'll go a little better if you are watching the slides and listening as we go along. I really appreciate the invitation to present this session of Ag Medicine, and I'm honored to be leading off the course this fall. And I really appreciate the diversity of folks who are taking the course. I think that all of you will find uh, thinking about zoonotic disease risks to be interesting to you. And I have an hour and a half to get through a fairly lengthy presentation, so we will be getting to that shortly. But before we get started, I want to make sure that uh, your expectations are in line with the reality. I do not consider myself a zoonotic disease expert, but as a veterinarian, I do have some insight as to which diseases of animals could also pose problems for people. As Jean said, for over the last 10 years, my outreach programs have focused on on-farm preventive health practices, what some call biosecurity, to prevent and control both endemic or existing diseases of cattle, such as Yoni's disease as well as emergency diseases that do not currently exist in this country, like foot and mouth disease. I was surprised to find foot and mouth disease listed in the assigned text as a zoonotic disease. This is a surprise because it is not considered a public health threat. But the reason it got on the list is because a few people with direct exposure to infected animals were diagnosed with foot and mouth disease, and this was published. So this illustrates one of the points of this session, which is to emphasize that evaluating exposure risk is absolutely necessary in order to identify zoonotic diseases when they occur in people. So as we go through this presentation today, I'm hoping that you will gain a better understanding of zoonotic diseases and how to assess and reduce exposure risks. We will take a closer look at six diseases. These, I think, were listed in your syllabus. We'll only have a passing mention of tetanus. And Lyme disease, I have left off of my presentation because that will be covered on a future webinar in this series. In place of that, I'm going to briefly cover a few zoonotic causes of small ruminant abortions. So that will give us a few more diseases on our list that we cover. <coughs> 
Before I go any further, I do want to credit Drs. Dunham and Bickett Weddle for originally putting together this presentation. Many of the slides are taken directly from, from their original presentation, and they did select the diseases for the course. Dr. Kelly Dunham is now an emeritus professor from the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Iowa College of Public Health. And he was a former director of the Iowa Center for Agricultural Safety and Health and former deputy director of the Great Plains Center for Agricultural Health. Dr. Danelle Bickett Weddle is the associate director for the Center for Food Security and Public Health, where she has been in that position since 2004. She manages the development of many materials for the USDA Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service for their, not only for their National Veterinary Accreditation Program, but also for many of the secure food supply plans, in addition to managing the center's infection control and biological risk management materials. So there are many, many resources on that, on the Center for Food Security and Public Health website on diseases I will be talking about today, and many other zoonotic diseases and foreign and emerging diseases. So if you want a good resource for more information, I recommend that site to you. As mentioned earlier, as we proceed through the webinar, I have some times when you'll be asked to either participate by using the um, polling feature near the top of the participant box um, or chat, uh, typing into the chat box. And if at any time I'm going too fast or you missed something and you think it would benefit yourself and others for me to go back and repeat something, please type in the chat box or use the raise hand feature. Jean or Lucy will get my attention and we'll get that taken care of. For other questions, I'll probably hold those till the end and uh, see if we can get through materials and time to take some questions before we end. And obviously, I'm available for questions after the course as well. So here we go. I appreciate Jean being on and Lucy for her assistance in facilitating the webinar. See if I can get to the next slide. Here we go. So maybe it's a bit unfair that I'm going to start out by asking you to share your experience with a zoonotic disease before we even talk about what that is with the whole class. But if you think you have had experience with a zoonotic disease, if you want to just briefly say what that was, um, what went on, that would be of interest to me and help me find out what what we've already encountered in our environment. OK, there's some coming in. I myself, obviously, have had some experience with zoonotic diseases. The first one was a rabid kitten that I met when I was in veterinary practice in upstate New York. A little kitten came in, uh, wasn't acting right, wasn't eating well. We ended up submitting the brain for a rabies test, and it was positive. So I had to go off to the emergency room for post-exposure prophylaxis for a few weeks and uh, explained to him that I needed one less shot because as a veterinarian, I had a pre-exposure prophylaxis shot as well. And cryptosporidium is very common for people who work with CAVs, grad students, um, I should say undergrads who worked with me when I was a grad student. Um, sometimes came down with diarrhea that we attributed to crypto because our CAVs did have cryptosporidiosis. Another one of my grad student colleagues had an undiagnosed enteric disease that sent him to the hospital. We knew that the calves he was working with had salmonella because we had diagnosed that at the, at the veterinary diagnostic lab. And we were never sure why the hospital refused to diagnose what was the cause of his illness. Uh, someone else had an exposure to rabies, so I guess that's not um, as uncommon as I thought. And maybe some of you have had this last one that I've, I've had experience with, ringworm. So I live on a dairy farm, and my son, a few years back, came down with classic ring sign of ringworm, which we were able to take care of. Um, but I myself had never had ringworm for all the years I worked with cattle. So we're going to talk about some of these issues, and we're going to use some words that may not be the easiest to pronounce when you first look at them. So we're going to go over some pronunciation before we go. Um, 
we are talking about zoonotic diseases, and if you look at number three, there's only one pronunciation option, zoonotic, and that's the one that we'll use. But the other terms have alternate pronunciations. So I am going to start out and have us try out our polling feature, and I'm going to ask you to let me know which option of, in terms of pronunciation is what you have heard um, or what you think is preferred in North America. So we're going to look at number one first. Would you pronounce number one A, zoonosis? or B, zoonosis. Would you pronounce one as A, zoonosis, or B, zoonosis? I'm curious what folks are thinking. OK, a few of you are willing to say what you've got. Lucy, I forget how to, how to close that and post the. Yeah, let me go ahead. I can do that for you, Julie. Let's uh, publish the responses to the whiteboard. There you go. All right, so it sounds like we have mostly North American folks on the line who agree that B is probably the most common way you're going to hear it in America, zoonosis. Um, but if you go to an online dictionary and press play to hear it, they're going to say zoonosis at you. How about if we look at number two? Is number two pronounced like A, zoonoses, or like B, zoonoses? Do we have any takers for A, zoonoses, or B, zoonoses? So we're getting about the same split there. So you will hear me refer to one as zoonosis and two as zoonoses, and zoonotic will be agreeable to everyone. So now we can move on. So where are we going in the next hour and a half? We've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to talk about what is and isn't a zoonosis, some ways of classifying these diseases, how to assess risk of exposure, and the, the routes of transmission of various zoonoses. We're also going to discuss ways to mitigate or reduce, try to reduce or prevent exposure to these diseases. And at the very end, we will look at a few diseases and talk about exposure risk and mitigation specific to them. And at the very end, when we wrap up, we'll have a quick quiz that should put you in good position for the follow-up quiz to this segment. Like I said, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to type them in the, tab, in the chat box. And I see that someone else had a, what they think is a zoonotic disease exposure. And that may have been ORF, contagious eczema that sheep can pass on to people. So we're going to start with a definition here. And I like to use a very broad and non-restrictive definition. And in this definition, zoonoses are considered diseases common to animals and humans. So note in this form of the definition, it's not directional. It's simply describing zoonoses as diseases common to animals and humans. This non-restrictive definition also includes diseases that have a common source in either an environmental reservoir or per perhaps involve an arthropod or insect vector and can transmit disease to either animals or people. Note that just because it's a zoonosis doesn't affect the course of the disease. So these diseases can be acute, sudden onset, over with quickly, or chronic, long-lasting, long-term diseases, just like other diseases. And sometimes they are unnoticeable. You may be infected with a zoonosis and not even know it. Um, sometimes they're just like the flu. And in some cases, they are very severe, severe or even deadly. There are many, many diseases that qualify for being considered as zoonoses. Over 200 exist in the world. For agricultural workers in the US, the list of zoonoses is about 40. And that's not to say that every person engaged in agriculture or encountering agricultural animals could be at risk of all 40 of these diseases. It really depends on the specific agricultural sector, type of work, geographic specifics, and so on. 
Now, we went over definitions, but this slide is in here just to remind us that terminology can be confusing when we're talking about disease names. So the common names of diseases, um, some of them are, are difficult because we use um, people's names. You know, I work with Yoni's disease in cattle. Would you think that Yoni starts with a J? Um, so that's just one type of confusion. And then there's disease names that we have both for a human disease and an animal disease, but the disease agent in each case is not the same at all. And we have four examples of that on this slide. So if we're talking about dysentery in people, we're probably talking about enteric disease caused by Shigella, or we might be talking about amoebic dysentery caused by, enteri en caused by entamoeba histolytica. But if we're talking about dysentery in swine, we're talking about a disease caused by the spirochete brachyspira. And just to confuse things further, when I was in vet school 20 or so years ago, brachyspira was called serpulina and had just changed its name from treponema. So even the disease agent names can change. And we've got more examples. Typhoid in people caused by salmonella typhi. In animals, when we're talking about foul typhoid or pylorum disease, this is caused by specifically Salmonella gallinarum. And how about erysipelas? We're actually going to talk about erysipelas in today's course. In people, there is a disease called erysipelas caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. But when we talk about erysipelas in animals, pigs, dogs, whoever gets it, we're talking about the disease caused by Erysipelothrix rhusiopathia. And then if we want some examples, this is probably the best example, the most different disease agents that have the same name for the human disease and the animal disease. Measles in people is caused by a single-stranded RNA virus. Measles in beef cattle refers to cysts in the muscle and the, the heart due to developmental stage of the human tapeworm Penia saginata. And by eating undercooked cysts in meat, people can be infected with this tapeworm, which is a common problem in developing countries, not one of the diseases that we're going to talk more about in this class. So as I said, my definition of zoonoses is broad and non-directional. There are specific terms. You don't need to know these for your test later. There are specific terms if you want to be clear about which direction of zoonosis you're talking about. And if you need some you know, vocabulary to impress your friends at a party, maybe you can bring one of these words along. If the natural host is human, then the term is a zooanthroponosis. An example of a disease that could go from a human to animal is Mycobacterium tuberculosis, TB. If the natural host is a non-human vertebrate animal, it is termed an anthropozoonosis. An example of that is leptospirosis, which we will talk about today. If humans and other vertebrates could both serve as natural hosts, then we have an amphibious I can't say this one very well, an amphizoonosis. And this would be true of many of the enteric bacteria, such as Salmonella, Streptococcus, E. coli, and so on. Now, another note on terminology, and I hope that everyone um, is very clear on the difference between an infectious disease and a contagious disease. So all diseases by nature, because we have a way of getting them, are infectious. There's a way for that disease to enter the, the system and cause disease. But just because someone gets a disease doesn't mean that they can spread the disease to someone else like them. So in cases where we can, you know, we can spread common colds and the flu to other people around us, that means we're contagious or have a contagious or communicable disease. But many times, as we'll talk about later, um, we get a disease, but it can't go anywhere, so we're considered a dead-end host, and we're not contagious. So we've gone over the terminology. Now let's think about who is at risk 
for zoonotic diseases. And some of these examples showed up in the chat box already. Two of the main, uh, well, you can think about um, who is at risk as anyone whose activities bring them into close association with animals or the environment. These types of activities can be broadly classified as occupational or recreational activities. So this class is an ag medicine class. It's related to occupational health. And so it's, it's important to remember that the occupational exposures, the occupations people have, can expose them to certain disease risks. But we don't want to overlook the fact that the public, the general public, can also have exposures to agricultural disease risks if they visit farms, open farm days, petting zoos, uh, field days, um, the Champlain Valley Fair, or if they're out enjoying the outdoors. The exposure of folks that work outside every day and the exposure of folks who are outside occasionally for recreational purposes, in both cases they can be at risk for zoonotic diseases. So we have to use risk management strategies to prevent or minimize our exposure. And the risk management cycle starts with risk assessment, identifying and defining the risk or risks, then thinking through ways to mitigate or reduce the risk, communicate about the risk and the ways to reduce the risk. So we've got risk communication aspect. And I'm hoping that all of you, whether it's because of your, the background you already hold or because of things you learn in this class, that you will be informed risk communicators about agricultural zoonoses. So of course we want to think about, give some thought to whether um, we have such exposures in Vermont. And some people like to come at it from the viewpoint of trying to figure out, well, how many people have exposure risk? And I don't have a really good way to get at that figure, but I can share some figures about how many livestock animals we have in the state and how many farms there are and how many folks those farms can interact with and that might help us think about this. The statistics on this slide came from the USDA Census of Agriculture in 2007. The 2012 figures are available and I will share those. They aren't terribly different from the 07, so I didn't change the slide. Um, but this will give you a sense of, of Vermont animal agriculture. So in the state there are over 10,000 beef cows. It's closer to 11,000 now. We have something over 100,000 dairy cows. It's probably closer to 134,000 now. We have in the vicinity of 4,000 pigs on commercially identifiable farms and a whole a, a greater, well, I shouldn't say a greater number, but there's a greater number of locations where you might find one or two pigs that are just either on a hobby farm or just in someone's backyard. Likewise with poultry, we have very few large production units in the state and many, many small backyard or hobby flocks. We do have a couple hundred thousand layers and maybe 300,000 broilers in the state and quite a few turkeys. Um, but our main exposure comes through the, the backyard or smallholder exposure. And then we have lots of sheep. There are closer to 19,000 sheep in the state now. And all of these animals are found on 7,000 livestock farms. And of course, we have other agricultural farms that have exposures um, to some of these diseases that don't involve animals. And if you think about on those farms, this is on the livestock side, about half of the operators are full time. So that means half of their time they have another occupation. So when they come into the clinic and they provide their occupation, they may not put farming as their occupation. So unless questions come up during history taking that reveal that they work on a farm, live on a farm, what their true exposure risk is, those potential diseases may not come to mind. So in addition to operators, obviously there could be employees, there could be students at universities who, that have farms, um, and our general public who comes to visit farms, field days, and so on, who do end up 
in positions where they can be exposed to zoonoses. I want to remind you of one of the um, readings that I provided you related to this topic, the Compendium of Measures to Prevent Disease Associated with Animals in Public Settings, put out by the National Association of Public Health Veterinarians. This document summarizes outbreaks for a period of time and discusses where uh, precautions failed or where precautions in the future could help prevent similar outbreaks in the future. It's a great resource, especially for anyone who's involved in a fair field day in any, in any role. Um, some really great information in that document. But now we are going to have a question that I'm going to direct you to the chat box to answer. And I'm going to frame this question in two different ways. So I want you to come up with two different answers. And if you see that someone's already provided the same answer as, as you want to, don't worry. Um, but I want you to think about what populations are at greatest risk. So the first answer I want you to put in the chat box is how would you describe a group of people? What adjective describes a group of people who are at exposure risk to zoonotic diseases? So go ahead and type in the chat box some of these descriptors of groups of people that we can identify at higher risk of exposure for zoonotic diseases. Good. Farmers, farm laborers, children, I assume children of farmers or maybe children who have the chicken project in their class at school. Okay. We're getting some questions that are actually getting at the second way I'm going to ask the question. So the second piece that I want us to think about in when we are thinking about populations at risk, so among those groups of people who have exposure risk, what types of people have higher risk for contracting disease? Who is more susceptible to disease? So you have suggested some of these already. So go ahead. You can keep typing in there. I'm just going to advance to the next slide so we can talk about these a little bit. So I have put on a few pictures of populations who are at exposure, elevated exposure risk. So here's our farmers, farm workers, veterinarians, others who do work on farms. How about pet owners? So our, our pets can also carry diseases that we can get or vice versa. So don't rule them out. Don't forget to consider them under the category of zoonotic disease. And then we have populations who are vulnerable. Okay, so as folks have typed into the chat box already, we've got the young among us, and someone indicated children under the age of five are generally put in that high risk category. Their immune systems are developing. They may not have some of the specific immunity that older people do, and sometimes their immune system responds in maybe an overreactive way compared to someone whose immune system is older. So they are an, an age group of particular concern. Um, Immunocompromised people, that's probably our largest category of, of people who have increased susceptibility. People can be immunocompromised for a whole number of reasons. We have folks who are in, on immunosuppressive drugs undergoing cancer treatment. Maybe they're on immunosuppressive drugs to treat other diseases. We have folks who have immunosuppressive diseases, think about HIV, AIDS. Then we have natural decrease in immune function as we age, so the elderly is considered a population with potentially lower immune function. And sometimes we forget to booster um, our elderly population against diseases like tetanus that can be easily prevented with vaccine. We also have on this list, and some of you have pointed out that pregnant um, women are in a vulnerable category. And we certainly want to minimize exposure to diseases that can cause abortion in people as well as animals. So I think you have done a very good job of identifying our at risk and those with greater risk. Thank <laughs> you. 
So this is not specific to zoonotic diseases that the risk depends on the exposure, but we can categorize the risks a little bit um, if we think about the diseases that different classes of animals might carry that could be zoonotic, and if we think about different places where people can encounter zoonotic diseases due to their activities being outdoors, for instance. Um, some specific activities put people at greater risk, so even those who are treating, working with animals, they may be day to day, not really at huge risk, but if they're treating sick animals, risk goes up. If they're vaccinating, this is particularly important for veterinarians vaccinating animals for brucellosis. They have to be careful with certain vaccines that can make them sick with brucella. Uh, handling carcasses, delivering newborns. So again, these are, these are situations that have a much higher risk for exposure to disease agents. Working outdoors exposes people to diseases that are transferred through ticks, mosquitoes, untreated water, um, that type of exposure. Don't get too caught up on associating specific diseases with specific classes of animals, especially with beef and dairy. Um, cattle are susceptible to cattle diseases. So just because it says beef cattle can get anthrax doesn't mean that dairy cattle or sheep or goats can't. They can, um, just like all mammals can get rabies. So um, again, under dairy cattle, we have ringworm. Well, we have pets who can have ringworm. So we have to look at all sources of exposure, um, but it can be helpful to have lists like this if you know someone ha who has um, swine exposure and you think, oh, well, yeah, I think it's one of those swine swine diseases and you can find it faster if you make that connection. So I hope, if nothing else, that going through this class will raise your awareness and raise your ability to raise the question, could this have been due to an exposure to animals or in the environment because of my occupation or my recreational history? A little more about characteristics of zoonotic diseases. I, we mentioned earlier that I um, do some work on emerging diseases or new diseases. And one of the concerns that we have is that emerging diseases are often zoonotic. So of the total number of pathogens of humans that are currently known, over half of them are zoonotic. 60%. But when you look just at the newest diseases that have been identified, about 75% of them are zoonotic. So we want to think about these diseases not just because they can cause sporadic disease or even epidemics, but some of them can be used in bioterrorism. And so we have more concerns when they're emerging and certainly when they're zoonotic for um, concerns along the lines of homeland security. On the other hand, one of the things that I mentioned briefly already is that humans are often dead end hosts for zoonoses. So they can be infected with any of the diseases listed on this slide, but are, are pretty unlikely to um, be contagious. So for instance, hantavirus, we get that by inhaling particles, dust particles containing virus contaminated with rodent urine droppings or saliva that carry the virus. Um, so it's really an environmental exposure. Another one like that that's an environmental exposure is tetanus. Okay, so we don't want to forget about tetanus, especially with our elderly folks. West Nile virus spread from birds to other animals by the mosquito intermediary. So it takes the bird to get the mosquito, um, to give mosquitoes enough virus to transfer to another animal. And they can make the, then the other animals can get sick, but they don't get enough virus in their circulation to pass it on to another mosquito. We, you will hear more about Lyme disease in a future talk, um, but here we've got ticks as the intermediary between wildlife, deer, mice, and bringing this disease to our pets and to people. <clears throat> 
Now, cow disease you used to hear a lot more about, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, we don't hear about that so much because the controls that were put in place have been very successful at reducing the incidence of this disease in cattle and people. Um, this was transmitted through brain and neurologic tissue, so we just don't eat those anymore. But again, not a communicable disease. Uh, people are the dead end host. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, we're going to talk about Nipah virus just real briefly. So this is an emerging disease. Um, and this disease can affect pigs and sometimes affects people as well. So there was an outbreak in 1999 in Malaysia where pigs were sick and then 100 people got sick and died in a very short period of time. Following that outbreak, things were cleaned up and they've never seen a repeat of that. Whereas in other countries, this disease picture is cyclical. So Bangladesh sees cycles of Nipah virus annually. India sees it sporadically in different parts of the country. Um, what I want to point out about Nipah virus and its connection with some other zoonotic viral diseases is that the reservoir for Nipah virus is the flying fox, which is a type of fruit bat. And bats are the reservoir host for quite a few zoonotic viral diseases. So if I were trying to avoid getting, you know, being the first one to get a new emerging disease, I would stay away from places where there are a lot of fruit bats flying around and interacting with wildlife. So is knowing about the zoonoses enough? Is that enough for them to be identified and practiced? Well, the reality is zoonotic diseases often are not diagnosed. And there are several reasons for that. They may be sporadic rather than epidemic. It is hard to track things down when you just have one case. The exposure history may be unclear, so some of these diseases are transferred from animals who appear perfectly healthy. The animal is an asymptomatic, sorry about the type of asymptomatic carrier, but people can get sick, so they don't realize that the exposure was from animals. Sometimes the signs are nonspecific. A lot of diseases look like the flu. And it's not, you don't just run off and order special tests when something looks like the flu, because usually it is. So it can be expensive to diagnose some of these things and um, it can be difficult to know which way to go. So things are either not diagnosed, they may occasionally be misdiagnosed, but more often are not diagnosed. And then we don't have a real clear picture on how frequent these diseases are in people, because they're either not diagnosed or they're not reportable. So we don't even have a real good sense of how common some of these diseases are. But if someone's going to find out and going to make a link that, yes, it was a zoonotic disease that was probably related to an agricultural environmental exposure, someone has to ask the right questions. That can be done by the person at the health clinic who's taking the history, or it can be the, the affected person or someone who's with them asking those questions, you know, could it be that I went to the fair two weeks ago? Um, so we've got to ask questions. Let's turn next to transmission pathways. So the disease transmission pathways are not specific to zoonotic, zoonotic diseases. These are disease transmission, these are transmission pathways that um, diseases of any kind follow. So they, diseases can be inhaled, and those are going to primarily cause respiratory issues. They can be ingested, which would primarily lead to enteric disease issues. There can be disease transmission by direct contact that causes a skin issue. There can be animal inflicted trauma. I like this one. Um, so bites, okay? So bites or other things can uh, transfer pathogens directly. They can be transferred by vectors, such as ticks or mosquitoes. Um, and in some cases, diseases are transmitted by this route called iatrogenic transmission. 
which means it's caused by the doctor. So the doctor might be treating you or doing an operation for one thing and you leave with another problem. Um, but one of the other routes that is not on this list that is probably familiar to most of you is the issue of noso nosocomial infections, hospital acquired infections, or even community acquired in infections, um, which are another exposure risk of their own. So we're going to talk about a couple, a uh, few of these pathways and specific um, risks that people in Vermont might be exposed to. So the first one is ingestion pathway, and we're going to talk about the risk of raw milk consumption. So clearly not only dairy farmers and maybe their employees, but also folks who are going to buy raw milk are ingesting raw milk and have the potential to ingest a whole number of different pathogens. By law in Vermont, dairies can sell, um, it was up to 160 quarts per day. Now it's 200 quarts per day or 1,400 quarts per week um, with the legislation passed in 2015. And there are testing requirements and inspection requirements that go with that, but we can't test every batch for every pathogen every day. So we are at some risk if we choose to drink raw milk. And I um, try to make it very clear to people who the vulnerable populations are and that they minimize their exposure. And all the folks who sell raw milk, whether it's on their farm or to people picking it up at the farmer's market, are required to put on the label at their farm and at, their, at the farmer's market a warning. And maybe some of you have seen this. The warning says, this product has not been pasteurized and therefore may contain harmful bacteria that cause illness, particularly in children, elders, and persons with weakened immune systems and in pregnant women can cause illness, miscarriage, or fetal death or death of a newborn. So that's a pretty strict warning, um, but people still do choose to consume it. And you'll have to ask the consumers for their, their answer to that question. So what are the pathogens that they could be picking up? There are many, and I'm not saying that these are common in Vermont. So listeria is really not terribly common in milk, but it is a problematic pathogen in that if it is in milk in a processing plant or a dairy facility, it can live in the environment for a long period of time and potential, have, pose a potential for contamination of product for a long time. Salmonella, like I said, is an enteric disease, Campylobacter as well. Campylobacter is the most common pathogen found in milk. National surveys have shown that over 90% of dairies have at least one animal shedding Campylobacter. So it's very common. And it's one of the most common causes of foodborne illness. So dairy and animals aren't the only place where you can pick that up. Um, but it is commonly associated, or not, not the only cause, but there have been reports of, say, kids who go on the, the field trip to the farm, coming home and developing Campylobacter um, cause diarrhea because they sampled the milk. So again, we can avoid that. And then there's some other contaminants. We'll talk about Coxiel a little bit later. Okay. We include discussion of diseases transmitted by the fecal oral route simply because these are so common. Um, and again, it's the exposure may not just be because of direct animal contact, but when we're using manure to fertilize fields, we are also potentially exposing um, more people to these pathogens. It's certainly a problem when people are working in agricultural settings and hand washing facilities are limited. Um, as I said, there may be plenty of exposure to manure, whether they're cleaning out stalls or they're working in fields that have been fertilized with manure. And the common signs of enteric disease are listed here. How about exposure to diseases transmitted by direct contact? So on this list, we have MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus contagious eczema or ORF, which some of our small ruminants can have and people can get 
this next one should say dermatophytosis. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that very well today. It should say dermatophytosis. Ringworm. And the last one, erysipeloid, is the human version of erysipelas. And we will talk about erysipelas and MRSA. What else do we have to worry about? Diseases transmitted by bite wounds or wound infections. Um, farm workers are not immune to these. So rabies I'll talk quite a bit more about. Tetanus, this is where my passing mention of tetanus ends. So tetanus is deadly in those who haven't had a vaccination before exposure or didn't get antitoxin after the exposure. Usually when we get an exposure, we know it and we go to the doctor and we're treated appropriately. But if you look at the statistics for who is dying from tetanus, the main classes of people who are dying are either elderly because they haven't gotten their booster shots or intravenous drug users. And I know we're talking about agricultural occupations, but in a rural state like Vermont, we're not immune from drug problems. So it's another thing to keep in the back of your mind that intravenous drug users are at elevated risk of tetanus. And then other bacteria can come in, and some of those can be pretty nasty. So we've talked about some of the bad things. Let's talk about what people can do to protect themselves. And in all the slides that say workers, just substitute people, because we've got all sorts of people who have agricultural and recreational exposures to these pathogens. And we can think broadly about what people can do to protect themselves. So before I tell you the answer, I'm going to see what you already know about what steps people can take to protect themselves from zoonotic diseases. Excellent. Wear PPE. And for those who don't know, I'll write it out here so I don't have to keep writing out. So this is personal protective equipment. Vaccination. So certainly make sure that folks who are working on farms are up to date with their tetanus boosters is important. Coming with clean shoes or cleaning, putting on clean shoes when they go home. Proper hand washing, excellent. I would think that you folks already looked at my next slide. So the basic approach that we should keep in mind is an informed worker or informed individual is can make an educated decision. So if they understand the risks and they know what personal protective equipment could be helpful at minimizing those risks, then they can either voluntarily wear it or in some situations you can require that PPE be worn. Providing facilities for people to wash their hands is very important. Um, having a change of clothes or having farm specific clothes is a good way to minimize bringing things home to the rest of the family. And here's our, our vaccines that we might want to keep up with. And some folks in agricultural occupations can get rabies prophylaxis, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So veterinarians and veterinary technicians are usually eligible for that. Some people put other good tips for preventing exposure or um, preventing getting a zoonotic disease, and if, even if they might have some exposure. So don't eat when you're working with animals. Keep your hands out of your mouth. Having separate work clothes, those are all really good practices that people can use to prevent themselves from getting diseases. So here are the specific diseases that we're going to talk about. As I said, I'm actually going to skip Lyme, and we're going to talk about a few small ruminant diseases. But we will talk about rabies leptospirosis, zoonotic influenza, MRSA, erysipelas, and Q fever. So we'll start with rabies. So rabies, Lourage, also may be known as hydrophobia. So this fear of water comes from the fact that it gets really hard to swallow and people are choking on water. Um, in people, the general progression is from pain at the site of the bite, 
to numbness or loss of feeling, to loss of muscle function, to paralysis, to death. There may be other neurologic signs, convulsions, excitability. Those are end stage signs. Um, that's the picture in people. If you want to know what the virus is that causes rabies, here is the scientific name of all that thing for you. The good news is that the rabies virus is fairly easily destroyed by disinfectants, by ultraviolet light, and by heat. It does not live on the surface of carcasses more than a day. It doesn't survive if the saliva is dry. It can survive inside the carcass or if that carcass is refrigerated. Um, so obviously when people are handling potential uh, carcasses of animals that potentially have rabies, they're wearing gloves, they're putting it in bags and so on. Oh yes, don't, don't tell me these stories. <laughs> I can get more specific info about disinfectants if you'd like afterwards. I didn't include that in the webinar. If you look at rabies incidents around the world, these are statistics collected by the World Health Organization. Red means it's a hotbed for rabies, so Africa and Asia have are endemic for rabies in both their animals and people um, end up getting rabies in these parts of the world. Annually, WHO reports about 55,000 people die of rabies. And the exposure in many of these countries is from dog bites of feral dogs, dogs, unowned dogs. South America has put in place very stringent efforts the last 20 years, vaccination programs for dogs. And it has been proven that vaccinating over 70% of the dogs will effectively prevent outbreaks in the human population. Um, so it's, it's a very, rabies, vaccination of pets and animals that people are closely in contact with is a great way to prevent rabies from getting into the human population. If you look at the animal reservoirs for rabies in the United States, we have our major li uh, wild wildlife species that carry rabies are raccoons, especially on the East Coast, skunks also on the East Coast, and other parts of the country, foxes, several parts of the country, and East Coast, mongoose on Puerto Rico, fox in Alaska. Um, these virus variants that are held in these different Wildlife reservoirs are slightly different from each other, so if an animal or person gets rabies, it can be traced to the animal reservoir. Um, but multiple variants can be found in one geographic region, as I will show when we get to the statistics from Vermont. So rabies surveillance is done in the U.S. Oops, sorry, next slide. This slide shows the um, distribution of wildlife rabies variants. It doesn't show all of the overlap, but it shows the major wildlife variant in each part of the country. And then if we look at surveillance, raccoons are probably the most common species submitted for testing in the east, and it comes up as the largest wildlife reservoir. And if you look at bat submissions, bat submissions from a broader geographic area of the country have been shown positive for rabies with this really hot bed in Texas. Um, so look out for the bats there. Now what about in livestock? So any livestock species can be infected. Um, there have been some cases of infected cattle exposing multiple people, so it is important to know what the signs are. Um, these are, they're not specific signs, but they're fairly typical signs for animals, for cattle that have rabies. So they may start acting different. They may separate themselves from the herd. They may be more aggressive or less aggressive than usual. Bellowing is commonly reported in rabid cattle. Failure to eat, they can't eat late in the disease. They get paralysis of the pharyngeal muscles. This may be mistaken for choke, and so people who are trying to see if the animal is choking reach in and may get an exposure if the teeth um, scratch their skin and there's saliva there. Um, eventually the animal will be paralyzed and 
and die or be euthanized and the brain submitted for testing. And then we know um, that there's been an exposure and people who meet the criteria will receive post-exposure prophylaxis. If we look at the history of rabies in Vermont, the last decade, roughly 50 to 70 or so confirmed cases are identified each year. And these confirmations are both from wildlife species and domestic species where brain tissue has been submitted to the lab for diagnosis. So as you can see, the majority of animal cases confirmed aren't specified. Most of them are skunks and raccoons. Um, a few bats and a few cats usually show up on the list each year. And occasionally, livestock. So over the past few years, there's been years where there's been some cows and calves, a horse, a sheep. Uh, one year, none of the livestock, but a domestic cat and two wild cats were positive for rabies. Um, sometimes it gets them all, livestock and pets. But again, most of the cases are in skunks and raccoons, have not been acting right, get submitted, sometimes foxes and bats. Any questions on rabies? Well, I have a question for you. So given what we know about rabies, how can people avoid being infected with rabies virus? Go ahead and type in the chat box. What are some ways that people can avoid being infected with the rabies virus? <laughs> okay, good. Stay away from animals that are acting strangely. Call animal control so that they can pick that animal up and get it tested if need be. Be very suspicious of animals that you think might be choking and don't expose yourself unnecessarily. Okay. Stay away from infected animals. Look for behavior changes. And don't forget one that I mentioned, vaccinating pets. If you vaccinate your pets, they're the most likely animal to come encounter with wildlife that may be carrying rabies, that may be infected with rabies. So if our, the animals that are closest to us are protected, they protect us. We can vaccinate most livestock species for rabies with a licensed vaccine. Only goats don't have a licensed vaccine. Veterinarians often vaccinate them anyway. If you have animals that are going to be on exhibit at the fair, they should be vaccinated for rabies. That means they need to be old enough to have to be vaccinated. Um, there's a question about exposure. So how do you get exposed to rabies? Um, it doesn't require, um, well, exposed through blood. So um, I'm going to give you a short answer, but I want to make sure that if you ever have a question about an exposure, that you contact the state public health veterinarian. The public health veterinarian is trained to identify, to classify whether an exposure is a true exposure that could put someone at risk of developing infection or if it's just, yeah, you were near it, but you're okay. Um, so true exposures can then be referred for um, post-exposure prophylaxis. But a true exposure requires that the rabies virus, which is shed in saliva primarily, came in contact with your blood. So it actually got into your system. So that's why it's a bite wound. Um, that's the primary route of a true exposure. But if you have scratches on your hands, for instance, and you're reaching down the throat of an animal without gloves, and that animal had rabies, you're probably going to be considered exposed. So that's where that, um, where that exposure to blood. It's not that you're exposed to blood, that, but that the animal's own blood got exposed to the rabies virus. Also got to protect um, mucous membranes, eyes. So when you're processing animals, people wear goggles and a visor and full PPE um, so that they don't pick it up on their, themselves. So who are you going to call? If you've got questions about a wild animal, use the rabies hotline at the bottom. 
see if I can use my pointer. Okay. <clears throat> so rabies hotline to report wild animals that are acting suspicious. If there's a human exposure or potential exposure, those will be referred by a healthcare provider to contact Dr. Bob Johnson, the state public health veterinarian. So refer people to um, public health um, or a physician and they will get the appropriate, um, be in touch with the appropriate people. The next disease we're going to discuss is leptospirosis and it goes by many, many names in people. Maybe the most common is wild disease. Um, it's found around the world in both domestic livestock and wild animals and the spirochete bacteria can live in the environment. So it can be in water, surface water, um, in the areas with infected animals. So all of these species are at risk and put people at risk potentially. Um, fortunately in the U.S. there aren't that many cases of lepto reported in people each year, um, probably because most infections are subclinical. People don't even know that they were exposed or, you know, that their immune system responded to lepto. But about 50% of those known cases occur in Hawaii. Probably the reason for that is that the disease does have higher incidence in temperate and tropical areas and wet areas. Um, but you got to think about the exposure. So there was a big recreational exposure in the U.S. back in 1998. There was a triathlon where all these people had to swim through a lake and about 15% of the competitors came down with lepto. So that's, that was a pretty significant outbreak. But all of these animals shown here are susceptible and um, the other thing that I want to mention is that if you get lepto and you show signs, they can show up anywhere from three days to two to three weeks after the exposure. So that's where the time from the exposure may be so long ago that you forget to think that, oh yeah, I was in a triathlon and now I'm sick three weeks later. Um, some, some of these diseases you've got to really look back at exposure history for more than a few days. What are the specific risk factors for lepto? As it, it's probably pretty obvious given what I just said that um, being near animal hosts, moist soils, streams and ponds are our risk factor. What's the mechanism of transmission? It can be transmitted by direct or indirect contact with urine from infected animals or handling an aborted fetus. So the transmission pathway that I worried about in vet practice was the cow swinging her tail across my face and getting potentially contaminated urine in my eyes and what was I going to get. Um, handling an aborted fetus is another concern or being in direct contact with contaminated water. So these are the mechanisms the, the um, pathogen can enter through mucous membranes. So many places where we have mucous membranes in the body might be more likely mid to late summer. Maybe that's because we have more exposures in that time. Um, maybe secreted or excreted more by animals that time of year. As I said, in people, people with lepto are often asymptomatic. They don't show any signs of disease. Or they show something like the flu or a flu with something just a little different. But there are times when people get severe infections. Um, they can suffer liver and kidney damage and even death. So there can be some very severe consequences to lepto. So how do we avoid it? Go ahead and type in the chat box some ideas that you can come up with based on what we said about transmission, transmission pathways and routes of exposure that tell us something about how we can prevent being infected with lepto. If you can go ahead and type in the chat box.
I don't know if people have run out of ideas or if you're still typing, but I'll give you some help. So clearly we want to avoid handling tissues that might be contaminated with leptospirosis or other pathogens. So use caution, wear PPE if handling placental tissues or any aborted tissues. You might control wildlife access. This is one where we worry about the rodents bringing lepto into a barn with livestock that then are closer to us. We can vaccinate livestock with vaccine against leptospirosis. Um, I won't say it's 100% effective, but there is a vaccine and it, it's actually multivalent against several different serovirus of lepto, of which there are many, 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 many. But those are the, the main um, practices that we have available to avoid infection. Vaccinating animals, using caution, wearing PPE when handling tissues or animals, and controlling wildlife access. Let's turn next to influenza. So influenza has three main types. And here it explains the association between the types and their, the species range affected. So type A affects the most different species of animals, including humans. Type B is pretty well limited to humans, human to human transmission. Type C is one that can be shared between humans and pigs. Influenza A is the principal zoonotic strain, and it is the number one type that is identified as causing influenza every year. As I said, it infects multiple species, can have very virulent strains time to time. And you may be familiar with the classification of influenza. So when we start springing the alphabet soup at you, we're talking about classification by the surface antigen types. And the main surface antigens are H, which is short for hemagglutinin, and N, which is short for neuraminidase. So they have, there are different, um, different Proteins have been identified, so they get numbers. So you can have H with some variation of numbers and N with some variation of numbers, and that tells you more about the strain. And if you look inside the virus particle, you see these separate segments of um, genetic material inside. And these RNA segments can recombine. So if two virus particles come into one animal and they're different types of virus to start with, they can get together and swap genetic material and then end up being a different virus that's then able to infect another animal. Um, that's all you need to know about that. What I want to focus on is this issue of interspecies transmission. At the center of this diagram, we find a bird. And wild fowl are the primary reservoir of influenza A viruses in the world. Now this diagram I should mention is taken from Fields Virology 4th edition. And the direct, or the red arrows, the dark red arrows depict direct transmission pathways that have been documented that disease has transmitted from one to the other as in the direction of the arrow. Um, you'll see just an orange arrow from wildfowl to humans. Direct transmission along that pathway has not been documented. But there is documented transfer from other animals close to people, from domestic wildfowl or from domestic pigs to people. And if pigs or poultry are affected with a virus that comes from different places or they get different types within their own body that can um, lead to a new virus variant and a novel virus that we can be exposed to. So 
a few years back, we were all worried about swine flu and H1N1 being the new pandemic. It didn't, um, there was a little pandemic, um, but it didn't go to the extent of, say, the flu of 1918. Um, but we still do have to worry about new flu viruses. This cartoon depicts why. So we have many different species that can be infected by flu viruses. They can, the viruses can swap genes if they're in certain animals. Um, and if those animals are close to people and infect people, and that particular virus also allows transmission from person to person, that's where we have the potential for a pandemic if it's a novel virus that people haven't been vaccinated for, don't have natural immunity to. Sometimes the virus comes from an animal into a person and it doesn't have what it takes to be transmitted to another person. So the, the person infected is a dead end host. So it stops there. Every year you can watch the flu outbreak on the CDC site. They track the reports of flu. This is from last year and you can see the peak of the epidemic was week 52 of 2014. And so it was really a, a late 14, early 15 peak that year. And if you look at the different colors, so red is influenza A, the most common typed virus. Yellow just means it wasn't typed. It was identified as flu, but not typed. But the green is type B, which is the human specific strain. And you see how there are more identifications of B when we get into summer and fall than earlier, than during the traditional flu season. Um, it's, that changes a little bit year to year and where the peak is changes year to year. So it's interesting to look at. And obviously each year the flu vaccine that's available is made with different strains in it. So they select them based on what was going around last year. Um, Usually they're pretty good, but sometimes they're off because the, the flu mutates so quickly and gets ahead of the vaccine. So we're always looking at new vaccines and always wondering how good it's going to be next year. Why are we so concerned about things like swine influenza? It's not only an important respiratory pathogen of pigs, um, but the pigs can be, as we discussed, a reassortment vessel. So a new flu strain can develop. And people can contract influenza, or pigs can contract influenza from humans. And here's a typo. Humans can contract it from pigs, but it involves very close contact. So those cute pigs, uh, cute pictures of people, especially kids, kissing the pigs at the fair, not a good idea from a public health perspective. Why are we concerned about avian influenza? Again, we're concerned because wild birds are a natural reservoir and they fly by as they migrate twice a year. Some strains that wild birds carry are highly pathogenic to domestic birds and we are in the midst of a highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak in the U.S. right now that started late in 2014. As of late June, almost 50 million birds had been depopulated because they were on a farm where H5N2 or H5N8 was diagnosed. This subtype to, subtype to date has been considered a low risk for public health, but caution is warranted. CDC is constantly monitoring. Um, as of yet, there have not been reports of this uh, avian influenza affecting people. Um, Given that we know that viruses can mutate, we always want to be keeping an eye out for that. So you're going to see a pattern here. As we get to the end of discussing each disease, we're going to think about what are ways that people can avoid infection with this disease. So let's think about what steps people can take to avoid infection with zoonotic influenza. And if you would go ahead and type some ideas in the chat box, that would be super. Any ideas on avoiding influenza infection? It's probably one of the hardest. <laughs> 
So good personal hygiene is high on the list. And in some cases, respiratory protection might be warranted. But even in the hospital, doctors don't go around wearing N95 respirators to avoid flu. So it's, it's generally um, not considered a high risk requiring PPE. Just avoid direct exposure. We're going to quickly look at MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. This is a bacteria that can cause skin and soft tissue infections. It is one of the first uh, well-known nosocomial or now community-associated pathogens. So we're not just worried about who touched the wall or the equipment at the hospital, but who else was in the locker room or worrying about athletes who come in close contact with each other. Almost 30% of the population in the U.S. carries staph aureus on their skin. Fortunately, only 5% of those are, are MRSA, but you think about the contacts that people have, and we have a pretty good chance of spreading staph from person to person in certain um, athletic situations and other situations. How about the connection with animals? We're probably a little more concerned on the companion animal side, and our companion animals have been documented to get MRSA from their owners, generating the new term humanosis. Um, looking at a connection between livestock and MRSA in people has, has been undertaken. Um, not as clear a connection there. Certainly animals do have, occasionally have, strains of staph that are um, multi-drug resistant, but less so than, than you would think. Um, probably the place where we're most concerned is on, on hog farms. So pigs can carry MRSA, and it's rather farm specific. So again, just like are the people around you carrying regular staff, or are they carrying a drug resistant staff? So on some swine units, they'll find MRSA. Others, they won't find it at all. And in units that have MRSA, more of the workers can be found to have been colonized with this bacteria. So it is a clear occupational risk. In cattle, not so close. And I'm, I'm going to skip this discussion in the interest of time. So here's our question ending with section on MRSA. How can workers avoid infection, or people, how can people avoid infection with MRSA? If you've got some ideas, go ahead and type them in the chat box. There's one real obvious one that I hope you're thinking of. Oh, maybe the problem is that I'm not seeing what you're typing, because I'm looking over here. Excellent. So I think Corey nailed it. Wear gloves, wash your hands, cover open wounds. OK? Yeah, antibiotics might be used to treat it, but certainly you're not going to use that in a preventative way. So great, excellent. Let's move on and we'll talk about erysipelas. Erysipelas, oops, thank you. I'm getting a time warning. Erysipelas in pigs is also known as diamond skin disease. And on this affected pig, the lesions look a little more like stars or blotches, but I actually treated a pig that had classic diamond lesions. It really does look like diamond back, diamond back disease. Um, this is caused by Erysipelothrix rhizopathia, relatively common pathogen of swine that are housed extensively outdoors with exposure to dirt, um, can affect poultry, can affect fish, can affect other species. I had a dog in clinics that was infected just because it had snorted some in. Um, it survives in soil, um, fecal material, it's found around the world. So how did the commercial swine herds get it out? They both um, implemented vaccination and exclusion. So most commercial swine herds are, the pigs are not exposed to dirt at all. So they don't have that exposure. And they were able to get it out of the commercial herds. 
When it gets into people, we're talking about erysipeloid, and here's some pictures of how that looks in people. Disregard the bottom face picture. Most commonly affects feet or hands. Can be very painful. The area that's infected may swell and have this purplish violet um, area around the lesion. May be difficult to move the joints. And the lymph nodes of the the draining lymph nodes of the appendage may be swollen and tender as well. So that's what you might want to think about if you see lesions like that. Uh, occasionally people get a septic form, and if they get the cardiac form, that does have a high fatality rate. The really only way to confirm a diagnosis of erysipeloid is through blood culture. All right, test your practical knowledge now. How can people avoid erysipeloid? Yes, so work with a herd that's free. And again, wearing gloves, so protecting that simple PPE may be all it takes. Hygiene, good. These are all great. All right, we're going to move fast now. Ready? Tighten, fasten your seatbelts. Q fever caused by Coxiella, Coxiella burnettii. It's a rickettsia-like bacterium, intracellular, very stable, very hard to kill, except pasteurization conditions are set to kill this pathogen. Um, this pathogen also makes it on the list of bioterrorism agents, and because of that, it is a reportable disease. So who gets it? So as far as diseases, this one hasn't been around that long, with the first description of it from Australia in the 1930s. Has also been found in the US. So um, there is some connection between Q fever and where sheep and actually any ruminant species are. And the outbreaks in people tend to be in people who are located near, especially downwind of flocks or herds that are outdoors where there is dust that can be blown in the air. Not too many cases per year, probably underreported, underdiagnosed, um, but it's a respiratory uh, aerosol transmission that is considered the highest risk transmission pathway. The pathogen can be found in other fluids and milk, but we don't think that's a high risk exposure or transmission pathway. Um, Ticks have been shown to have this in them, so potential that ticks could transmit Q fever, um, and person to person is rare. So let's take this case. A male dairy farmer, 46 years old, goes to the doctor, thought it was influenza. Two weeks later, wasn't much better, was having more trouble, went to the emergency room. Again, they're thinking, it eh, looks like influenza, but we're going to send you to the infectious disease specialist. Fortunately, this specialist did a test for Q fever, put the man on antibiotics, and resolved the problem. This farmer had no direct exposure. So his cattle hadn't had births or abortions, but there are his, yeah, his dairy cattle. But there were some beef cattle across the street that got tested. A couple of them were positive. So again, maybe it's that indirect pathway. Uh, a paper that came out in Epidemiology of Infectious Diseases did a really deep dive looking at um, potential transmission. They looked at bulk tank surveillance, found it in lots and lots of farms in bulk tank milk. Uh, this was the paper I was talking about that did the deep dive. So when they really looked at the literature and case histories, it's it's definitely associated with um, airborne transmission more so than ingestion. So milk doesn't seem to be a, a high risk transmission pathway. But let's think about how people can avoid infection with Q fever. Whoops, got to look at my notes. Yeah. So we don't really see many people doing that. You know, I might move if I was downwind of a big sheep farm. Um, 
and you know, so it's it's tough, right? So we know there's this potential exposure. Not very many people get diagnosed, so people don't really take uh, protective steps very seriously. Certainly, direct contact can be avoided. You can use PPE if you're handling other infective tissues, um, delivering new newborns, or handling any aborted materials. Um, and that is the case as well with these diseases that affect small ruminants and pose human health concerns. So we're just going to talk about them quick on this slide so we can get to the wrap-up quiz. But the concerns that come to mind when small ruminants, these are sheep and goats, when they have abortions, stillbirths, um, or potentially they are asymptomatic carriers for diseases that can affect people, of, and this is a particular concern to women of childbearing age. So we don't want to expose people to Coxiella, Q fever, brucellosis, which in sheep or goats could be brucella ovis or malatensis, chlamydiosis from chlamydia, toxoplasmosis from toxoplasma, or vibriosis from campylobacter. So all of these, um, well, the, many of these, um, present in small ruminants as abortions or stillbirths. So this is the high risk scenario. Um, and I'm just going to cross through these real fast. If someone wants more info, certainly connect with me later and I can get you more info. Or you can go to the Center for Food Security and Public Health and read all about it in their fact sheets. So toxo is one that we also have concerns with when people have cats in the home. And this risk can be mitigated by wearing gloves and cleaning the litter box frequently so that the toxo has not advanced to the infective stage. So fairly easy to mitigate that risk in the house. Again, Vibrio caused by Campylobacter, um, different forms in people, enteritis, or an opportunistic septicemia. So. We can think about specific transmission pathways of specific diseases, or we can think broadly, OK, if we have folks that are in agriculture or engaged in outdoor activities, they're going to be at some risk. Let's understand what they are. Use appropriate personal protective equipment. Wash hands, especially before eating. Change clothes before coming in the house. Um, for people who are involved with vaccinating animals for brucella, avoid needle sticks, wear the goggles, wear the gloves. Um, these are practical steps that can reduce risks of getting diseases that we don't need to get. Now, I promised to skip Lyme. And we will wrap up here. So we discussed the broadest disease of zoonosis, being that of a disease that is common to humans and animals. We talked a little bit about different ways they can be classified, both by what causes the disease, what types of exposures, what animal species we're exposed to, the direction of transmission. But really the important thing is to understand that these diseases may be un undiagnosed because they're not recognized. They don't rise to top of mind unless that history is elevated to the foreground. There may be vague symptoms. They're nonspecific. They look like the flu. They may resolve spontaneously. And unless you die, sometimes people don't really care what killed you. Uh, unless, unless you die, they don't care what's making you sick. But when you do, then suddenly people are really concerned. Um, the animal that, the, that was the exposure may not be sick. Um, but I guess the good news is that once infected, humans are often just the incidental or dead end host, and hopefully not the dead host. Prevention is worth a lot. These diseases can be costly to control. There are costs involved with surveillance, um, costs of, of treatment if treatment is needed. So let's use a risk management approach, assess the risk, communicate about risks, and take steps to mitigate those risks. Ready for your quiz? We've got one minute. I've got one minute on my end. You guys game for a quiz? All right. There's eight questions, and they'll be quick. So get ready to point to your little letter box so you can respond to each question. <laughs> 
Here's the first one. All right, Catherine's with me. Zoonoses are diseases common to animals and humans. Select A, B, or C. And I'm going to have, um, well, actually, I'm not even going to bother posting your answer. We're just going to whip through these. But I've got to get on the right slide here. All right. So we got that one right. We are, that is true. How about this one? Zoonoses are easily recognized and diagnosed. A, B, or C? The bees have it. All right, this is one that can be over, overlooked. How about leptospirosis? Can leptospirosis only be contracted by direct contact of mucous membranes with urine? A, B, or C? Yeah, I made you think on this one. Made you think. Is the only route direct contact? No. So there are some other transmission pathways. We can have indirect contact with mucous membranes or contact with those uh, aborted fetal materials. How about this one? Rabies only affects wildlife in Vermont. A, B, or C? Absolutely. So it can spill over into our domestic animals and our humans if we're not careful. How about this one? Is a bullseye lesion a sign of MRSA? A, B, or C? So you kind of had it easy because I didn't talk about what covered what causes the bullseye. You'll get that in, a next, in another webinar. And how about this one? Can a person be infected with the pathogen responsible for this animal's skin problem? A, B, or C? The A's have it. Yes, indeed. Erysipelothrix. It causes erysipeloid in people. Is milk an important source of Q fever bacteria in terms of causing disease? Is milk the way that people get Q fever? A, B, or C? You got it. So inhalation is our primary pathway in people. And I think this might be our last one. Can pigs get swine influenza from people? A, B, or C? Yes, indeed. So it can go back and forth. So don't, don't be kissing those pigs. And with that, that is the end of today's webinar. I thank you all for your participation. And like I said, if you have any questions for me, please forward them to me um, by email. And I'll stay on if anyone wants to stay on and chat. Thanks, Julie. I'm going to just go ahead and uh, shut the recording off now. And uh, we'll hand it back over to Jean.